amount of time talking about and studying and learning and then practicing. All we have to do is open the newspaper, turn on the news, log on to the internet to see discord, division, and hostility. And not only in our national politics, but in the world around us, here in our local community, and dare I say, <coughs> even in our own homes, behind closed doors. So this series on peace is designed to answer, I think, pressing questions that we all have. Questions about peace. First, we have Jesus, who we understand is the Prince of Peace. We can read that in scripture, but do we really understand what that means? What is the Prince of Peace? And how can this Prince make a difference in our lives? Next, we have the priest, the peace that surpasses all understanding. How can we get it? Don't we all want to know? And then more importantly, once we have it, how can we share it with others? Third, we have peacemakers, which we understand in Matthew 5, the peacemakers are blessed. Is it possible that we can learn to be peacemakers? I hope so. And then finally, we'll study peace on earth. What does peace on earth look like? And is it more than just an impossible dream? In the weeks to come, we will be hopefully stretching uh, preconceived notions that we have about peace learning new things, and it's my prayer that we'll come away with a revived sense of purpose and commitment to our faith, and that we would become peacemakers and change agents. I think it's especially important given what's going on around us today. I can't help, and I'm sure I'm not alone, uh, being bombarded by the political process that is churning around us. The disunity, division, and antagonism breaks my heart. I've never seen anything like it, and I know I'm not alone. And I fear what will be left of our country once the voting is over. How will we reunite and truly be the United States of America? As Christians, we have a role in peacemaking. We have a responsibility to God, to work, to bring peace. And that, my friends, is what this sermon series will be about. And I think it couldn't have come at a better time than now, as we enter these last three weeks before the election. So let's begin with Isaiah chapter 9. This scripture is usually read as a precursor to the Christmas story, the prophecy of the coming Christ. The words are spoken to Yahweh from the prophet Isaiah on behalf of the people. It is written, you'll notice, in the past tense, a child has been born, giving God the ultimate authority that this thing will be done. It's already been done. It isn't written as, well, maybe it will happen, or, or perhaps, or it might be. It is written in the context of something that will be done, has already been done. And from the perspective of the stable in Bethlehem, we see this as an announcement of the birth of the Messiah. Some suggest, though, that it was actually written with another royal child in mind, one already born. Not everyone believes that it is, in fact, about Jesus. But this scripture from Isaiah is for us. It is this scripture of hope, hope of a wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The ancient promise of a son of David on the throne is reaffirmed in this scripture. Both the names of the child and the final lines of the poem perpetuate peace with justice and righteousness. 
Now we love to read the prophecy from Isaiah about the birth of Christ, the long-awaited Messiah predicted by Isaiah and birthed into the world in a stable in Bethlehem. And in a world filled with war and violence, it may be difficult to see how Jesus could be this all-powerful God who acts in human history, the embodiment of peace. But physical safety and political harmony are not necessarily the kinds of peace that Jesus is talking about. In Hebrew, shalom means peace, and it refers to the appearance of calm and tranquility within groups or individuals or even nations. The Greek word for peace is irene, E-I-R-E-N-E, -E, and it means unity and accord. But the deeper, more foundational meaning of peace <coughs> is the spiritual harmony brought about by an individual's restoration with God. I'm going to repeat that. Peace is the spiritual harmony brought about by an individual's restoration with God. Now, can any of you remember a time before you became acquainted with Christ? Do you remember the disunity and discord, the confusion and chaos that surrounded or ran your life? Do you remember? Now can you think back to those times when your decisions were made by ungodly means? And then now can you recall the, the moment or the time in your life when you made the decision to accept the peace that Christ offers, when you put aside your selfish ways and accepted the peace that Jesus offers, when you committed yourself to being a disciple of Jesus Christ, your life was transformed. My guess is it's never been the same. But that doesn't mean that it hasn't been without strife or without conflict. It means that through the trials, we had a peacemaker in our corner offering support and guidance, leading us back to him. When we became followers of Jesus Christ, the love, joy, and peace that floods into our very core is provided to us by the Holy Spirit working in our lives. And when we are filled with this love, joy, and peace, we can't help but share it with others. We witnessed that earlier today when Connie shared about that love that she received on Friday night. Now that brings us to our second scripture this morning. I threw another one in there. Those of you looking at the bulletin are thinking, there's no second scripture. <laughs> Ephesians 2, 13 to 18. And it, it is here that we see the fulfillment of the prophecy in Isaiah 9. It is Christ who is the Prince of Peace. And in this scripture, we see that it is Christ who bridges and unites, unites all of us in peace. It is Christ who is our peace, not the world, not our bank account, not our shoe collection, not our fancy cars. It is Christ alone who is our peace. The passage in Ephesians talks about both groups and that both groups will be reunited. Of course, they were talking about the Jews and the Gentiles, but I would argue that we can replace Jew and Gentile with black and white, Republican and Democrat, male and female, rich and poor, Christian and Muslim. The divisions are all around us, and it is Christ alone who can reunite us and bring us a lasting peace. Paul describes to us how Christ does this, how peace can be brought in any area of conflict, whether among individuals or nations. And through this letter to the Christians in Ephesus, Paul says that Christ is our peace. He made peace, and he came and preached peace. Peace is oneness. It's harmony. 
It is the sharing of mutual enjoyment. It is being one with God. And the peace that Christ offers us is a lasting peace. It's not fleeting or temporary. Now consider those who think of peace only in terms of the cessation of fighting. It may appear that peace has been ushered in because there's no evidence of conflict. But if the peace is not centered in Christ, then the peace is temporary. And the conflict may continue to fester under the surface. I think we have seen that recently in Syria. But Christ is the author of peace. He is the Prince of Peace. He owns it. He ushers in the peace that will be satisfying, permanent, and genuine. And what Paul is saying is that in order to live at peace, we must be at peace first. And the problem with most of us is that we want to start with just clearing up the, the results of the conflict, not the cause of the conflict. But God never starts there. God starts with the cause, and the cause most often is us. We are the most likely cause. And he says that peace is a person, capital P, Jesus. And in order for you to live at peace with someone else, you must first be at peace with the person of Christ. If you have his peace, then you can start solving the conflict around you. But you can never do it on any other basis. So the place to start, the, the origin of peace, is the set, settling of any problems that you may have between yourself and Jesus Christ. That is the place you must start. Sometimes I meet with people who are in the midst of conflict or disagreements. Sometimes when things aren't going so well, they ask me to come and to help with some guidance. And more often than not, the place that we all need to begin before we can resolve our problems is to refocus ourselves on Christ. If we don't have the Prince of Peace firmly planted within us, everything we do will fail. Everything will, that, that we try will be colored by the emotions that we're feeling. Anger, frustration, fear, sadness, or self-righteous attitudes that believe that really, really, the problem is that person over there. It couldn't be me. Before we can begin to bring peace or healing to a situation, we must first declare that Christ is our peace, our Prince of Peace, and He alone can bring resolution and peace upon us. Christ alone can make us one, can make us whole. And once we have Christ firmly planted, we must look for the walls that we've erected that divide those things that cause divisiveness and seek Christ to heal it. What is it that creates the hostility that robs us of living in peace? What is it that makes us so convinced that our problems aren't ourselves but those people we're trying to work with, our spouses, our children, our parents, or maybe our co-workers, we're blind to our own self-righteous hypocrisy and until we admit that, we are no better than the other. We must realign ourselves with Jesus, leveling the playing field, and recognize that all of us are in need of grace. We all need forgiveness. And when that is accomplished, the hostility can be removed. We see this in John chapter 8 when Jesus confronts a woman who has been caught in adultery. Although the law in this situation is clear, she must be stoned to death. But Christ was able to redirect those in the crowd to think about their own guilt. And they all realized very quickly that none of them were without sin. And like the adulterous woman, 
they all needed grace. And it was grace that Jesus gave them. Jesus came to abolish the law by changing our focus from the hundreds of ordinances and commandments and refocus us on Christ and refocusing ourselves on his ways and on his new commandment to love God and to love one another. And in doing so, we access that peace. Christ fulfilled the law in himself and by doing so, he rendered both Jew and Gentile, rich and poor, black and white, all of us, unacceptable before God. He showed them how the law was meant to be fulfilled. And when he saw his impeccable life, when they saw Jesus' impeccable life, the Jews knew that they were as guilty as the Gentiles. That's what Paul argues in Romans 2, 3, and 4. I invite you to read that later. The Jew realized that they had no advantage over the Gentiles simply because they know more truth, that they stand exactly on common ground, Jew and Gentile, both in need of forgiveness. And so our Lord gave them a common ground of forgiveness, and when he did so, there was no hostility left. So this is the way to start ending hostility and move toward peace. Stop being self-righteous. Remove the demand that one must change without acknowledging that we must change ourselves. And when we can admit that we must stop focusing on the errors of the other, hostility can be removed because it is us who must change. But as long as one is, insists that it is the other who's all wrong and there is nothing at all that she needs to change, then of course hostility and resentment remain. Hostility comes by self-righteous demand. Remove the demand and the hostility ends. And when we can do that, sisters and brothers, peace will be achieved. When we step outside of ourselves, when we acknowledge that we need grace more than the other, we can begin to access the peace that the Prince of Peace has to offer. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for this lesson about your son, the Prince of Peace. As we seek to be more like him, remind us to humble ourselves, to offer grace to those who oppose us, and to recognize our own need daily for your grace. And we ask this all in your name.